we've done these, started doing these facts of your friends segments and some little inside baseball. How it works is we have a team meeting once a week or once a month and we go through, here's, here's what all folks are writing in and asking questions about. Here's what social media is, are asking questions about. And then here's some trending topics across the planet, especially in the U S of things going on. And so people want to know Delaney, what your take is on these things. And I missed a meeting. I was doing something. And so today we're talking about on, on everyone's favorite facts of your friends segment. Today we're talking about the rise the global rise of tarot cards. Let's do this. Get your marble reds and your uh, tight jeans and your mustaches. It's time for Facts of Your Friends. All right, so why in the world are we talking about tarot cards? <sighs> surprisingly and not surprisingly, tarot cards have seen a massive resurgence globally, but especially in the U.S. since the pandemic kicked off. And now they're being incorporated into... Psychology, psycho, psychologist office and counseling offices into anti-anxiety responses, into Christian faiths and all sorts of faiths all over the place. They're all over social media, TikTok. You can now schedule Zoom tarot card readings across the planet. So before we get going, listen, listen, no one, and I mean no one is going to like what I have to say about tarot cards because I'm going to talk about all your little precious everythings, all of you. So listen, I don't know anything about tarot cards. I don't know the history of them. I don't know where they're from. I don't know if they're like from some occult. Like, I don't know. One time on social media, I recommended that people like that yoga was a good practice. There's some, there's some great research about yoga and trauma recovery. And people wrote to me like, do you know tr yoga is from Satan himself? Listen, I just like wearing my stretchy pants and standing on one leg. That's what I like. And so I don't, they're, everybody just take it down 30%, 40%. Also, I'm going to be talking about your precious Enneagram and your essential oils and all that. So no Hogwarts spells cast on me and no tarot card spells, if that's even a thing. Okay, cool. All right, great. I entered this. I got this topic. They handed me a bunch of... Uh, Articles, I entered this with the way I in, like enter all of these things, with curiosity, not judgment. I went in going, huh, I'll have something to learn about, not I'll show them, right? One of those is very open-handed. One of them makes me an idiot. All right, so here we go, tarot card readings. All right, uh, 14 to 1500s about suit symbols, like they're cards. They're like giant playing cards, if you will. Um, cups, swords, batons, and coins. Those will change your life. And things like sun, moon, star, temperance, death, traitor, old man, wheel of fortune, fortitude, chariot, justice, love, pope, emperor, empress, mount, mountebank, <laughs> the fool, all these different cards, okay? Um, and then in the early 1900s, Arthur Waite, Pamela Coleman Smith, they got together and drew what is now the, the more modern version of these cards, okay? And they kind of, they fell into the occult world they started out as just basically parlor games. Like we're playing these, like we're having some drinks and we're playing cards. Um, I, in my head, it's like Texas Hold'em in the 1400s. And then over time, they had some mystical and div divine properties attached to them. And then they turned into this more occult thing because they were like, I'm going to predict the future, like fortune telling, right? And then different religious groups got all wor worked up about it. And then anyway, here we are. So during the pandemic, uh, Sarah Pulliam Bailey in her Washington Post article says sales tripled during the first year, similar to what happened during the 2008 financial crisis, uh, sales of tarot cards. Um, I read multiple articles and all of them made very clear that the modern use of tarot cards is not for fortune telling or for predicting the future. It's not for like, what should I do? Am I going to meet a lover in three weeks or am I going to get fired from my job? That's not what they're for. They're about stories and symbols, which psychologically is a very union concept, right? Uh, and quite honestly, symbols and stories is something we all do, but that's a whole other conversation. Sarah Pulliam Bailey says it's part of a wider trend of younger Americans mixing and matching different forms of spiritual or religious practices with one another. Not for trying to seek or meet the divine or to have a relationship with God, however you would describe that, but they're trying to find some method to the madness that is their life. She goes on to say, quote someone as saying, more people are now more interested in it for the self-reflection or space to get validation and clarity versus hearing 
you're going to meet some hot stud in three months. Get ready. It's, that's not what they're for. So she says they're great for anxiety. Eh, maybe. I've got some issue with that, but they may not be predicting the future, but they do. You can slow down, shuffle, look at the pretty pictures and say, oh yeah, I'm overthinking this. So if I think of tarot cards, not as a fortune telling device, that's silly and it's nonsense. We all know that. But if I look at them at, I say it's silly and it's nonsense. Somebody just cast a spell on me just now. They have, they pulled out their John Delaney voodoo doll and are just jabbing pins in it. Don't do that. My life's sketchy enough as it is. Be nice. But as a tool of reflection. So this is where I'm going to make everybody uncomfortable. I've always said any tool for reflection at any time is good. I include in that Myers-Briggs, strengths finders things, Enneagram, um, your essential oil, anything that you use to codify and explain your automatic default settings to things, the stories you tell yourself, the roles you've taken on in your life, any of those things that, get, that you look at and go, huh, I usually respond like this. And that gives you pause and you think through, why do I respond? And huh, why do I do that? None of these things have good science behind them. Zero as reasons to, I'm not going to hire that person because they're an Enneagram four and we need a six in this role. If you treat it like that, bad news bears, dude. Or if you're like, I'm not hiring that INFJ, they're going to fail at this job. That's discrimination. That's silly, right? That's silly. But they are great tools for reflection, for asking yourself, huh, I do respond like this more often than not. And I do have a tendency to fill in the blank, right? Those are good. Our culture needs more reflective practices, okay? So number two, I got online and did a free tarot reading. I kept waiting for like the pit of hell to open up and get me. It didn't. I just got tired because it was after nine o'clock. But listen, I did it. And it was fascinating. Here's what it told me. <laughs> One of the cards, the first card was, I'm going to find a new love soon. And a new relationship is headed my way. And so naturally I thought, well, I'm married, so that's not great. Um, and then I thought this, my wife and I have been going through what I would call a very significant transition over the last six months. I have a new teenager. I've got a first grader. So we are out of this half day stuff. We're out of the kindergarten world. And my career has gone sideways. My wife is getting recognized at stores now apart from me. She's got people at doctor's offices and, and, and haircut places asking her about the show, which she doesn't listen to, right? I am getting stopped in airport bathrooms. So our, I'm getting, we're having family dinners and people stop. So our life, none of this is bad, is well, getting stopped in an airport bathroom. That's just super weird. But our life has changed. It's shifted. It's, it's, and so we are... Uh, it made me think back to Estelle Perel, which she said, all great, great, uh, I mean, all adults have three or four or five great loves in your lifetime. And if you work really hard, it's with the same person. And so then I thought back, oh, yeah, we're entering into a totally new season. My wife is a different person now. She's the mother of a teenager, the mother of a first grader, the mother of a guy who is on the Internet it's talking about sex all the time. I am the husband to not a professor, a research professor who's traveling all over the country presenting research. I am the mother of a stay-at-home mom who lives in the woods and who makes sure we have eggs everywhere because the chickens aren't dying. And our life is completely different. And she's got new ways of seeing the world and I've got new experiences. And so then it made me think, huh, I am going to get a new love. I, am, I have a new life. My wife and I have entered a new stage. And this reflective idea at my kitchen table, looking at an Instagram or whatever it was, tarot card, was actually really healthy. It was good for me. That actually gave me pause. It's a conversation I'm going to have with my wife later. Number three, in my new book, I have a chapter called Choose Belief. I make the case both through ancient wisdom and through science. I believe that one of the cornerstones of having a non-anxious life is you cannot Self-actualization cannot be the cornerstone because the, the self can't hold the universe. It can't hold it. It's not strong enough. And we're, the, the more we try to shove the self into the center of the planet, the more anxious it gets because it's saying, I can't hold, I can't hold. And so you got to choose some sort of belief. And belief, I think, often starts with reflection. Number four, I was having – I mentioned this to a caller earlier. Um, 
connection. I was having breakfast this morning with my buddy who's a physician, and we were talking about how I've noticed over the last five to 10 years, the more I go to the doctor, when I go to the doctor, they're touching me more, not inappropriately, but they always have their hand on my arm or my shoulder. And I, and they look me in the eyes better than, than 15 or 20 years ago. And I always leave the doctor's office whew, so calm. Even during hard conversations, you're going to have to have surgery. I leave so calm. And then I got to thinking about the, the, the research in, for counselors and therapists and psychologists. People are so desperate for someone just to listen to them, not waiting for their turn to speak, but just to listen and say, how are you? Tell me about your life. That I'm wondering if the rise of tarot cards is giving people an excuse, very similar to the questions for humans. It's a conduit towards human connection. I want to look you in the eye and you listen to my stories and you listen to my life and you tell me about things that I'm not seeing in my own self, the rise of coaching, the rise of therapy, all those things. And I'm wondering if tarot cards, the rise of them, are, is just a way for finally someone's listening to me. The last, here's my final thoughts. These can be super dangerous and stupid, quite frankly, if they use them in the wrong way. There's reams of data on priming. Um, I call it nudged learning or expectations in learning. Um, Luna uh, Coloca has done a lot of work on here. We're always absorbing cues in the environment, how we should respond to something. What that means, and a lot of this is unconscious. So if I think I'm going to get a response, I may be leaning that way. If I think this card is going to tell me if I should break up with my girlfriend or my wife, and it says you're going to be finding a new love, my body can run down that lane before I've thought it through. So if you're going to use tarot cards or anything similar for secret messages from the universe, you're putting yourself at risk for making rash, unwise, unsafe decisions. And I personally don't put a lot of stock in these things because I am rash and I make rash decisions and I'm a mess. And so I don't mess with them for that very reason. Um, if you're going to use them for fun or to jumpstart conversations or questions or, or about important topics or just something fun for a friend like Dungeons and Dragons or online gaming, whatever other things you're into, knock your lights out. Don't use them as a tool for big life decisions. Nah, you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble to doing that. Okay. Um, priming is a real and unconscious thing. So Kelly, that's my thoughts on tarot cards. You know, you had me a little nervous earlier because you wouldn't tell me the angle you were taking. I thought that was fantastic. Tarot cards it is, America. Let's do this. I am a queen of wands. I think that's a thing. No? 